Warm welcome to the Nobel Prize Museum. My name is Kalio Meikstedt and I'm a teacher and educator here at the museum. The Nobel Prize Museum is situated in the old town in Stockholm and here we share the knowledge about the history of the Nobel Prize and the Nobel Prize laureate's achievements for the benefit of humankind. Every month we have teacher seminars here at the museum, usually with hundreds of teachers on, on site in the museum. But right now we are online as everybody else. Today's topic is about utopias and dystopias and how we all can work together to restrain climate change. And the program for this hour is as follows. First to go is the geologist Alistair Skelton, who is here with us today at the museum and will give us an overview of the latest development in climate research. After that, we will listen to the researcher Camilla Brudin Bori, who will introduce us to the utopian literature. We will also meet the inspiring teachers, John Bang and Philippe Longchamp, who will share some thoughts on how to teach about the climate and the future. And thereafter, we will take part of a short lecture by the Swedish Academy member, Kjell Esp Mark. He will give us some examples of utopias and dystopias in the Lit Nobel Prize awarded literature. And towards the end, museum educator Lotta Jepson will tell us about some elements of utopias and visions of the future among the objects in the museums here today. And during the seminar, we will also tell you about the brand new uh, scientific project called Utopian Stories, in which you and your students can be co-researchers and contributors to scientific researchers. And at the end of the program, you will hear more about it in details. But now we will have the pleasure to listen to Professor Alistair Skelton, director of the Bolin Center of Climate Research. And the Bolin Center is a consortium of 400 scientists. And for your information, this presentation will, along with all the other presentations today, uh, be available afterwards, so you can use them in your own classroom. So, big welcome, Alistair Skelton. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to talk to you now about what climate change actually is. So, I'm going to begin in this building. Now, I live in Stockholm, and this building is also in Stockholm. Uh, this is our old observatory, and for over 200 years, we've been measuring climate in this observatory. And I'm going to show you what the data looks like. So what I'm going to show you now is a graph which shows the temperature in Stockholm all the way back from 1756 until 2020. I'm going to use a technique called warming stripes. And what that means is that you're going to see blue stripes for cold years, red stripes for warm years. You can see that the scale there goes from four to eight degrees, which is the typical average year temperature in Stockholm. So let's have a look at that. Now, when you look at that, you can see that it varies from cold years to warm years. That's the blue to the red. But when we look at the last 20 years or so, they're all red. They're all extremely warm. Um, and if we look at 2020, it's nine degrees. That's already off the scale. And if we look to the future, we see the temperatures just increasing and carrying on. About a tenth of a degree every two or three years here in Stockholm, so far north. That is climate change. So what causes it? Let's take a look. So the cause of climate change is carbon dioxide emissions. We release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And let's look at how that's changed from 1850 up until 2019. It's just climbed and climbed and climbed. So we emit a massive amount of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So where does that carbon dioxide actually come from? Well, this is a picture also from Sweden. It's from the south of Sweden, the area called Skåne. Um, and it comes from coal, which is just a rock, um, and oil and gas. Coal, oil, and gas together collectively or fossil fuels. Now these are geological materials. They're found in the rocks. So where do those fossil fuels come from? 
That's right. Dinosaurs. Vegetation plants from 200 million years ago in the time called the Jurassic. That's where the coal comes from. That's where oil comes from. That's where gas comes from. So that means climate change is a geological problem. We take dinosaurs, plants, and in 200 million years, they're converted to coal, gas, and oil. And just 100 years, we convert them to climate change. Those are impossible numbers to grasp, 200 million years. What can that possibly mean? Let's compare. Let's make 10 centimeters 100 years. That's about the length of a pencil. So what's 200 million years? Well, this is a Swedish analogy. 200 kilometers, which is the distance from Stockholm to Linköping. Wherever you are, think, what's 200 kilometers? What does that compare with? That's the scale we're talking about when we're comparing time scales. So we now need to think about this on geological time scales. We need to think what's actually controlling the climate. We measure climate, and usually using temperature because it's easiest. And Earth's average temperature today is 15 degrees, warmer than Stockholm. That's because Stockholm's quite far north. So what is it that controls climate? Heat from the sun, albedo, and the greenhouse effect. Now, you probably know what heat from the sun means, and you probably know what the greenhouse effect means, but albedo might be new. So let's, uh, let's take a look at all three of those and think about it for a minute. Right, well, um, and the way we're going to do that is we're going to use a question. Um, and it's a question which my guess is you know the answer to. Which planet is warmest and why? Well, we're comparing Venus and the Earth. Well, I gave you Earth. It was 15 degrees centigrade. Is Venus warmer or colder? What do you think? 464, Venus is warmer and a lot warmer. But the interesting question is why? So let's look at those controls of climate. Heat from the sun. Well, it's like a radiator. The closer you get, the hotter you get. Uh, Venus is closer to the sun, gets more heat than the Earth. We measure heat in the same units that we measure to measure the how powerful an oven is. Um, Venus gets about 658 watts for every square meter of its surface. That's about the same uh, energy. That's what you'd need to pop popcorn in a oven. And it, but it gives Venus a temperature of 55 degrees. What about the Earth? It gets about half that, which would give Earth a temperature of 6 degrees. So the first thing we can see, the temperatures are wrong. They're not what they actually are. So we need more controls. So let's now take a look at the albedo effect. And I'm going to use my cat to explain it to you. Uh, this is my cat. She's a white cat. That means she's got high albedo. She reflects heat from the sun back out into space and keeps herself fairly cold. She's a smart cat. To keep herself warm, she's sitting on a black seat. The black seat's got low albedo. It absorbs heat. So albedo is the ability to reflect heat. Um, well, let's look at the albedo effect. Well, Venus, you can just imagine that Venus is a bit like my cat with that whitish atmosphere. Venus reflects most of the heat that arrives at its surface. Um, and that puts Venus's temperature down to minus 45 degrees centigrade. Earth's albedo is much more complicated. We have dark oceans and we have light colored clouds and ice caps. That reflects about a third of the heat we get, giving Earth a temperature of minus 18 degrees. Well, it's obviously wrong. There must be something else. And we're nowhere near the real temperatures of the planets. So let's take a look at the greenhouse effect. Here's my cat going to help us one more time. Uh, my cat, has, has, because of being white and having high albedo, can be a bit cold. So she's crept under a blanket. And that blanket keeps her warm. It keeps in her body heat. Earth's greenhouse is somewhat different. It's Earth's atmosphere. And in that atmosphere, there's a very important greenhouse gas. That's carbon dioxide. 0.04% of Earth's atmosphere is CO2, and that helps keep us warm. That's actually too much. It should be less than 0.03%. It lifts Earth's temperature from minus 18 by 32 degrees, natural warming, and one more degree, that's already what we've added, and that gets us to 15 degrees. Now, if you really want to understand how important CO2 is, let's go back to Venus. Now, Venus, um, has an atmosphere with 96.5% CO2. So it's mostly CO2. So what does that do? It takes the temperature from minus 45 up by 511, and there we are at 464 degrees centigrade. 
So let's summarize. On geological timescales, climate is controlled by one, heat from the sun. Heat rises, temperature rises. Albedo. Albedo rises, temperature falls. Greenhouse effect. Greenhouse effect rises, temperature rises. So those are the controls of climate. But these three factors vary naturally but over geological time. Remember, 200 kilometers compared with 10 centimeters. It's a, geological time is big. Um, and that, that variance explains why it was actually warmer than when there were dinosaurs on Earth. It was actually something like 10 or 15 degrees warmer, but that was a very long time ago. And it explains why it was cooler during the last glaciation. It was four degrees cooler, in fact, globally. The variations are thankfully suppressed. By, the, uh, by an inbuilt mechanism, the Earth has to protect us from sudden and, uh, and severe climate change. That is carbon dioxide's slow cycle. So let's take a look at that. Now, how this works is um, carbon dioxide is released from rocks and from the Earth to the atmosphere by only one way. That comes from volcanoes. Um, but it doesn't build up in the atmosphere because just as much is taken away. And that is taken away by rocks they slowly dissolve. And as they dissolve, they remove CO carbon dioxide from the atmosphere at exactly the same rate as added. And that keeps the climate stable. Now, if the, if the climate gets too warm, temperature rises, the rocks dissolve faster, taking away the carbon dioxide and cooling us down again. Um, if, on the other hand, the Earth gets too cool, the rocks dissolve more slowly. So the, volcano, the carbon dioxide for a volcano builds up in the atmosphere, warming us up again. It's a brilliant system. It preserves life on Earth. But now we emit too much carbon dioxide. By burning fossil fuels and change land use, we emit 90 times as much carbon dioxide as comes from volcanoes. So it's too much and it's too fast. So let's just explain what I mean by too fast. Let's emit 1,000 carbon dioxide molecules uh, in 10 seconds by burning fossil fuels and changing land use. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take 10 more seconds um, and we're going to allow the rocks to take that carbon dioxide away. But look, the rocks have only managed with one molecule. 999 remain. It's far too fast. We cannot expect the Earth to cope with the amount of carbon dioxide we emit to the atmosphere. And then Earth's temperature rises. And that causes heat waves. That causes droughts. That causes stronger storms and hurricanes. That causes forest fires. That causes the polar ice to melt. That causes sea level rise. That forces people to leave their homes. It's all together called global warming. So now some good news. In 2020, carbon dioxide emissions fell by 7%. That's the biggest drop that has ever happened, a 7% drop in carbon dioxide emissions in 2020. We're going in the right direction, but 2020, was not a normal year. I took this picture in the Swedish town of Ystad, um, and you might not know what avstånd and omtanke mean. Avstånd means, you can probably guess, keep distance. Omtanke means care. 2020 was not a normal year. There were lots of things that were very, very different about 2020. We did different things. We did less things. We changed the way we live. The climate started recovering in 2020. But how did you feel? Were you sad? Were you indifferent? Or were the things that made you happy about the changes we made to our lives during 2020? This research is about what can we learn from the pandemic this is a picture of my mother-in-law. She got her inoculation against the coronavirus yesterday, uh, which means she's now protected. She survived the full year despite being 85 and in a risk group. Why? Because we showed intergenerational care. Young people kept distance from one another. Young people stayed at home when they were sick. 
young people wash their hands more often and more carefully. What we can learn from the pandemic is about intergenerational care. We can also show it for this person. This is my daughter. She has a right to a future. She has a right to a beautiful future like the lives we live in today. Caring for the climate is showing care. So that we will together solve the climate crisis and we'll carry on. These are the emissions reductions we need with the start we've already got to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees. This is what it looks like at the end of the decade of action. 2030, 25% of our, is all of our present day emissions is all we're allowed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alistair, for this educational and insightful lecture. In order to make good choices, for us and for the planet, we need stories and ideas about the future that we want. In our time, dystopian tales of the future dominate in literature as well in films, games and television. But today we also want to highlight utopian literature and reflect on how utopian stories can become a lever for a brighter future. Our next speaker is Camilla Brudin-Bori. She's a researcher and teaches literature at the University of Gothenburg, also at the Teachers' Education Program. Some of her courses have themes as the good life and utopian and dystopian literature for children and young adults. A warm welcome to Camilla Brudin-Bori. Hi, I'm from Gothenburg University and there I work with a project on literature and its ability to create and understand the future. I will here talk about the utopian and the dystopian way of telling stories and maybe how we can use to think about the future and uh, about themes like transition and climate change within those genres. Dystopian stories for young adults have been yeah, recently become very popular ever since Susan Collin released her The Hunger Games uh, and introduced the dystopian future themes into literature for children and young adults. We have been flooded by many dark visions about the future. These books you see here, three books, they all tell about the future where it's scarcity, climate has collapsed and we have overused the resources of nature, totalitarian societies have developed as a consequence and so on. So they all tell about a bleak future. But even though those stories uh, are very popular and they're very thrilling to read, it's also wise I think to take a step back and Take a look on what kind of future they actually depict. The protagonists of such dystopian stories, they are often young uh, and they have this huge task to fight back the system and save the world. And, and this serious uh, feeling also um, seems to be given over, given over to the young readers. So to tell about the future in this dark way, it has a long tradition, but the utopian way of telling the story has even deeper roots. So let's go back to the 16th century, and here we find Thomas More. He's an English lawyer, and he's a statesman, and he's very interested in improving the society. He writes Utopia. Uh, it's a story that after More becomes very popular as a genre, and it gets very imitated. Utopia tells about Thomas, how Thomas More, he meets a Portuguese sailor and this sailor tells more about this perfect country. It's an island and it's called Utopia and it turns out that this country is really a fantastic place. It has a good societal order, communal ownership of plants, private property, men and women, they are educated alike and so on. So this this was very different from the society in Moore's own time. And to even suggest such a radical change, that could actually be punished by death. So how did Moore get away with it? Mm? Well, utopia, it's a play on words. It's derived from the Greek prefix u, and meaning, that's meaning not. 
and topos, that's meaning place. So the name literary means nowhere, emphasizing the fictionality of it. So in this way, Moore could actually deliver rather sharp critique in his own time when critics often got executed and Utopia, it had a vision, but it was also fiction, right? Hmm? So, but today we know that some of Moore's ideas actually had been realized and uh, this way he was writing, it got very many imitators. So what's the classical recipe for writing an utopian story the way Moore did it? And actually this, this uh, way can be used in the classroom as a writing practice. It's, it goes like this. In most utopias, there, there is a protagonist, a hero. He or she ends up in a mysterious land, and it could be a secret valley, it could be an isolated island or the future. This place turns out to be fantastic in some kind of way. Sometimes it's realistically depicted, sometimes it's a fantasy line and could contain such things as speaking animals. Uh, and there are actually no or few limits to what a utopia can contain and be filled with. And th this is one point with it. Our hero, who is now a, the guest in the new country, he gets on a guided tour to see how a better life could be organized. And Utopia here stands <clears throat> in, in very sharp contrast to the author's own time and his own society. And this is the point with Utopian story, this contrast. So. It uses knowledge, it uses fantasy, but also visions to describe the ideas of an approved way of living just by creating alternative images. And this kind of story, it delivers a critique, but through shaping positive scenarios. And in this way, fiction can become a field where you can try out, we can lab elaborate and even play with new ideas of looking at and solving problems. And in this way, uh, this is one of the, the features of literature and fiction that is very important, I would say. If you're going to try to write utopian stories in your classroom, it could be good to first discuss with the pupil what they want to improve for the future. The teacher can introduce themes like sustainable development, climate and future, or equality and peace. That's good themes. So here's an example from 1915. It's taken from the US and it's the feministic author Charlotte Perkin Gilman that is fighting for female rights in her time. And she wrote a utopian novel and she called it Her Land. In this story, three men end up in a secret valley and they turn, it turns out that this land is inhabited with only females. It's of course a perfectly well-ordered land in terms of democracy, but also uh, environmentally and aesthetically. The three men tries to dub, but they find it hard. And in this way, it gets a little bit funny. But Perkin Gilman, she could use Moore's classical recipe to launch her own ideas about an equal world. And if you see, take a look at the, the picture here, it sh shows the book covers from a lot of different times after the book was published. And they, I think, speak their own language, how differently women actually have been seen And now I will sort of talk a little bit about a dystopian example uh, to, to make uh, clear the contrast. I've chosen Margaret Actwood's Oryx and Crake. And this story will take us into the future where the climate has collapsed as well as democracy. And Atwood is actually, when she's telling this story, using the devices of the dystopian genre. She is taking things that's frightening in our own time, like gene splicing and surveillances, and she's making it bigger and she is investigating what if. Think, what if those tendencies were to grow larger and more prominent? So just in the, as in the way with the utopian genre, the dystopian story criticizes tendencies in the present society, but instead of creating a positive counter image, the dystopian story shapes a dark prediction. So a teacher 
in languages can use those two genres to teach and investigate uh, the present by asking questions where we're going, what future do we really want. You can address challenges as transition towards a sustainable future by letting your pupil write stories that actually describes what we want for the future, not focusing on what we are afraid of. It's quite easy to follow the concept of Thomas More to write utopian stories and uh, shaping positive images for the future and sort of letting loose fantasy and the creative abilities. We have a research project together, Utopian Story, and my task is to analyze and collect uh, stories for the future. So please help us, please help us and write and share your future story. It can be long, it can be short, but uh, it should tell about your future dream, about a good future life. How do you picture a good future? Greta Thunberg, she used to say that we have to listen to the scientists, but in this project we want to listen to you. So you are invited to help us collecting future stories and to let your pupil become our citizen scientist. And it could be good to, to help in this work, to work with the utopian and the dystopian themes. Uh, at the Nobel Prize Museum as a web page, you will soon find free lessons, pedagogical visualizations, tips for the future reading and much more. And I will come back together with Professor Alistair Skelton uh, to answer questions a little, a little bit later and we will explain a little bit more how you can help us uh, to become part of and a citizen scientist of our project. So, Utopian Stories, thank you. Many thanks for this, Camilla Brudin Borg. So we are devoting this teacher's seminar to questions about the climate and different perspectives of the future. But how can we address these issues in the classroom? With us today, we have two teachers who have thought a lot about this. John Bang is a music and English teacher at Skapa Skolan in Huddinge. He has been working as a teacher since 2007 and has always tried to combine and integrate music with other subjects. Philippe Longchamp teaches high school students in history, technology, and ge ge geography at Bilingual Montessori School of Lund. Philippe is also the recipient of the award uh, Best Teachers in Sweden 2020. So I would like to, like to start with a short question, even though we could talk about this for an hour, I guess. How has the last year been for you as teachers? What, would you like to start, John? Yeah, OK. Can you hear me all right? We can hear you. Yes, thank you. Oh, I think it's been OK, actually. And uh, uh, I work at a school called Skapa Skolen in Huddinge, and we were actually pretty well prepared for this uh, to switch on to online learning since uh, every student has an iPad and uh, all the teachers were very used to work with digital resources. So considering the big change, I think it's been uh, interesting, if I have to choose a word. Uh, it's, it's been uh, developing to be able to try out new ideas and new ways of working. So I, I think it's been pretty well. And then, of course, you sometimes worry about the consequences and um, we will yet to see the, how it, it, it has affected the students' uh, results and their well-being. But um, for the most part, I think it's, it's been okay, actually. What do you say, Philippe? Well, I agree with, with John here. And throughout 2020, our school remained completely open. But since January, we've been offering a blended learning experience to our students from grades 7 to 9. And there we mixed online classes with active learning, hands-on workshop and uh, labs at school. Um, yeah, our school is, is a bit unique. It's, it's where we have language immersion profile in English and French and Swedish, and where everyone from preschool to grade nine is exposed to three to four languages on a daily basis. So um, yeah, it's, the Swedish experience is quite unique, I guess. John, I would like to ask you, do you think uh, would you say that your students look brightly on the future? 
Uh, I've been thinking about that question actually, and, and you have to keep in mind that I teach mostly uh, teenagers, and teenagers have their ups and downs regardless of what happens in the world, the world actually. And I think that that hasn't changed very much uh, from earlier generations. Uh, but, um, well, yeah, I, I guess they do sometimes. Uh, it depends on how you um, meet them and how you talk about stuff and how you um, are able to uh, take them in, uh, to, in into the teaching materials and, and let them guide you. And uh, this is something that we work uh, with uh, very much at, at my school. Uh, asking you, Philip, what obstacles do your students see when they think about the future? What, what worries them? Well, to be honest, I think the greatest obstacle is the wave of disinformation our students are exposed to. And that's why teaching for critical thinking has become one of the most important topic right now. So teachers need to, to learn to counteract students' anxiety about the future. And our only chance to give them hope that decisive action can lead to improvement is to give inspiring examples. Like for example, um, the story of Mexican scientist and Nobel Prize laureate in chemistry, Mario Molina. Uh, his story can inspire us to find ways to teach about climate change without causing anxiety and despair with our students. Uh, Mario Molina is the hero that discovered that CFCs were depleting the ozone layer and he found a solution to solve that problem when the Montreal Protocol of 1987 phased out the production of CFCs. So stories like these can empower teenagers and inspire action. Sounds great. John, we heard Alistair earlier talk about climate change. Uh, how do you work as a teacher to, in order to create the balance between the justified climate anguish and still transmit hope and, and, and the will to act? Yeah, um, I think the key word is to work uh, with the students and to talk about uh, the matters, the climate matters. And um, the best examples I have to give is when the students themselves react on something uh, we had an example last year where uh, we saw a documentary about um, sharks and uh, shark fishing. And uh, after the documentary, uh, one of the students kind of outbursted that uh, we need to do something. And uh, so we started the project, Save the Sharks. And uh, uh, everyone was very involved. I, I feel that uh, maybe uh, they need a mutual enemy to, <laughs> to gather them. Uh, 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 and, to, yeah, to, to find a unity and, and to work together. And I think, think that this will leave them with a, a good memories um, and a, a sense of hope and a, a sense of accomplishment that you, uh, you're, if you want to, if you uh, really try, if you uh, uh, get the chance, you can make a change. Hmm. Okay, great. One final question to both of you. Today, to, today at this teacher seminar, we are launching our new project called Utopian Stories, where we invite students and teachers to become co-researchers and help us to collect data and stories. Um, how do you think your students will benefit from participating in a project like uh, Utopian Stories? Uh, start with you, Philip. Yeah, I think they'll learn to see the bigger picture and also learn to trust the scientific method to solve problems. And this way we have greater chance of success to overcome the challenges of the future. And for us at our school, the students are used to that because since 2012, we've been doing some type of transdisciplinary project, one called Utopia and one called the Exoplanet Project. So we will be able to adapt this uh, and hopefully we're gonna also help students to become even more creative because the solutions to these problems, they are found in creativity. Thank you. And what do you say, John? Well, I, I feel that working in projects in general uh, creates a sense of, um, uh, it's very, it, it's much more memorable. And uh, as I said earlier, it leaves the children with uh, a sense of uh, uh, hope actually sense of hope that you can, you can do something if you try. If, if you hands-on save some charts, uh, you, you get a kind of a, a receipt on a good work, good job. Uh, uh, we did something. And I feel that uh, working in projects in general creates that sense. 
Perfect. Thank you. And uh, thank you for being with us today. And good luck with your future teaching. Thank you. Thanks. Recently, we heard Camilla Brundin Borg talk about uh, the utopias and dystopias. But what about the Nobel Prize awarded literature? Are there any utopias or dystopias to be found there? Well, soon we will know. Kjell Esmark is Emeritus Professor of the History of Literature at uh, Stockholm University. And since the last 40 years, a member of the Swedish Academy. He is also author of a large number of poetry collections, novels and short stories. And we are very happy to have Shell with us here today, telling us about utopias and dystopias in the history of the Nobel Prize. A warm welcome, Shell S. Mark. Utopia and the Nobel Prize. What is the position of utopia and dystopia in the history of the Nobel Prize? When this unexpected question is put to the documents, you get an equally unexpected answer. Silence itself is telling. The first great representative of the genre, Jules Verne, didn't die until 1905, and there had been plenty of time to propose him. But obviously, no one in the literary world regarded him as serious enough for the prize. This is also true of H.G. Wells, the author of The Time Machine, 1895, The War of the Worlds, 1898, and The War in the Air, 1907, quite rightly called The Father of Science Fiction. He was not considered worthy of a proposal during the first two decades of the prize. He was not considered until 1921, then by a Swede, the literary historian Henrik Schuck, who was a member of the Nobel Committee. Schuck's proposal was emphatically re rejected in the committee report signed by the historian Harald Jane. Well, it was found to possess lively imaginative power, but his later loose writing on various matters was disqualifying. Schrick insisted that Wells was not only inventive, but also a great poetic force, even if a dilettant on humanistic subjects. To sum up, however, Schrick was most hesitant about the candidate. Recurrent judgments after Wells' death in 1946 got no further than this ambivalence. Remarkably, though he was praised for great imagination, no one touched upon his utopian or dystopian works. They simply had it an eye for the new genre where Wells was a pioneer. In the meantime, a follower of Wells had been discussed, Karel Czapek the Czech author who coined the concept of robot in his drama R.O.R. -R. It was proposed every year from 1932 to 38, the year of his death. The author's, quote, inventiveness and unusually versatile intellect was praised, but his books found to be fireworks lighting up just for a moment. Not until War with the Nudes, that is, the Salamanders, was the committee tempted to consider a prize. Here they saw an amphibian between Jules Verne and Swift, a contemporary satire which seemed extraordinarily pertinent and brilliant. Finally, however, the lack of depth was found to single out Charpik's works from genuine poetry. This means that still in 1946, the year of Wells' death, no work of a utopian character had managed to pass through the needle's eye. But that very year, Hermann Hesse was awarded the Nobel Prize, and thus a remarkable work in the genre comes into focus, The Glass Bead Game. This is a novel situated in an unspecified future and in an equally unspecified 
Castalia, where, unlike the martial and the generate surrounding world, people dedicate themselves to art and humanities with an ultimate expression in the glass bead game. Wikipedia can inform us that the glass bead game was probably the decisive motive for the prize. If this had been true, it would have been the first homage to a utopian work in the history of the prize. However, the reality is another. Hesse had been of interest in the Nobel context since 1931, when it was proposed by Thomas Mann. The committee member, Anders Rösteling, had promoted the candidate, but without success in the rather pupilistic 1930s. Only a renewed academy going in for the pioneers of literature could do full justice to Hesse. But the books then pointed out were Steppenwolf and a few minor prose works, plus poetry, the noble musical form of which is unsurpassed in our time. About the glass bead game, which appeared in 1943. Not a word. An earlier judgment had commented on an ex expert report, which, in spite of the boldly high-flown aim, had found the utopian novel tiring. Nothing indicates that the, quote, huge volume was bestowed a closer study. Not even a humanistic utopia could arouse interest. The first utopian or dystopian work appealing to the Academy seems to have been Harry Mattinson's Aniara. That this work, already an opera and an international event, was important to the prize of 1974 is obvious. The latter part of the prize citation for writings that cast the dewdrop and reflect the cosmos is addressed to Anyara. The speaker at the Nobel ceremony, Cora Najiro, also dwells upon Martinson's tragically beautiful vision of a spaceship steering away from an increasingly hostile existence on a frozen Earth, itself losing its course, cut off from destination as well as home. But Space Utopia has one more representative on the list of laureates, Doris Lessing, with the five volumes of her Canopus in Argo. And she's actually a renewer of the genre, who gives philosophy, in the first place, Sufism, a place at the expense of technological invention. It's been assumed one time that the prize was directed just to this a utopian sequel, another time that Lessing was honored in spite of it. Let's here establish that the words of the prize citation, that epicist of the female experience, are obviously addressed to all her writings. The speaker of the prize ceremony, Per Vespe, gives Canopy in Argo a distinct but restricted place in his talk. He notices that observers from another galaxy report on the final stage of our civilization. The scrutiny of a divided civilization mentioned by the price citation thus includes an examination where observers outside the Earth describe our ext extinction in the cool perspective of eternity. But the scrutiny doesn't stop there. It's true of her whole work. The latest exponent of the utopian or rather dystopian genre is Kazuo Ishiguro's Never Let Me Go. The novel takes place in England in the 1990s, but describes a horrible reality that fortunately history has not yet reached. The apparently idyllic boarding school hailstrom where the pupils are cultivated humans 
meant for donation of organs up to their death. In Saradanius's speech to the laureate, the narrator Kathy H. is one of the four figures she points out in Ishiguro's fiction, a clone who is a keeper of the horrible institution. Never Let Me Go is undoubtedly one of the novels that, according to the Price citation, have been covered with great emotional force, the abyss be beneath our illusory sense of connection with the world. It should be added that in his first novel after the prize, Clara and the Sun, Ishiguro has returned to dystopia. In a worn down USA, the narrator is a humanoid bought to be the company of a dying teenager. It is Carl Charpik's Robert Red Returns, now humanized in a work of a Nobel laureate. The examples of utopia or dystopia are, as we can see, there are rather few in the history of the Nobel Prize. The Academy was also for a long time unwilling to attend to this new genre. Not even Hesse's humanistic utopia could tempt it to widen its field of vision. Aniara was the first work to arouse the interest that you might have expected. Thank you. Thank you for this very inspiring briefing, Shell Esmark. We will linger a little longer uh, around the Nobel Prize because now we will hear about some of the objects in our exhibitions here at the museum. Uh, maybe are there some connections to the topic of the evening even there? My colleague Lotta Jepson is standing right in our exhibition and we, she will share two stories uh, about two of the objects there. Go ahead, Lotta. We are right now in the gallery of the Nobel Prize Museum and this is where we show a lot of objects that have been donated by Nobel Prize recipients that we call Nobel Laureates. Every year when they arrive to Stockholm to receive their Nobel Prizes, they also make a visit here at the Nobel Prize Museum and we have then asked them to bring an object that has had an importance to them in their work or in their lives that, get, that they can donate to us. And uh, we have received a lot of interesting objects over the years and I'm going to show you two of them today. We'll start uh, with a personal calendar in this showcase right here. Uh, and it's a calendar of Olga Tokarczuk, she's a Polish writer and a Nobel laureate in literature of 2018. And this calendar is from 2018 and it's full of notes about what she did every day during that year. But it doesn't say anything about the Nobel Prize. Um, and that has to do with the fact that the Nobel Prize in literature of 2018 was postponed. So she was awarded it one year later and she found out about it one year later. And this whole thing made her feel like she was in a time machine. And, um, and now we have this calendar here and it's kind of a symbol for this feeling of being, well, ending up wrong in time. And this displacement between time and also between different, over different borders and between different perspectives is something that uh, Olga Tokarczuk is phenomenal at, um, if we look at her literature. And her literature is, consists of many different perspectives. In, in many of her stories, we find the perspectives of many different protagonists. And in one novel called Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead, uh, we see the perspective of the animals. And this book has been called an eco-thriller. Um, it has been called a utopia. And I'm not going to tell you very much more about it, except that it kind of challenges our view of the world and of the balance, the power balance between animals and, um, and humans. And maybe that is what's needed sometimes in order to create sort of utopian ideas of a utopian society, a better society. We need to just challenge the way we look at the world right now. Something about these objects is nice when I look at them because they're kind of ordinary at the first 
when we look at them at first time, this is kind of, I have uh, a calendar like this at home, for example, but uh, the stories behind these objects are not ordinary. They could tell something about a strange year of a Nobel laureate, for example, like this calendar, or they can tell us something about a fantastic discovery, like the next object I'm going to show you. And it's over here, and it contains some utopian, if not at least science fiction vibes, I would say, this discovery. So if we look into the showcase right here, we find some scotch tape, we find some pencils, a piece of graphite and a transistor. Pretty ordinary uh, objects, I would say. But uh, they were donated to us by the two Russian physicists, Andrei Gaim and Konstantin Novoselov, who were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2010 for having done experiments on the new material graphene. And graphene is a pretty cool material. It is very thin because it's only one atom layer of carbon thick. And uh, it's, very, it's so thin that it can be called two-dimensional. Two and it's also very conductive of both heat and of electricity. It's stronger than steel. 100 times stronger than steel. And at the same time, it's flexible and it's transparent. So I can imagine it has some very interesting applications it will have in the future, maybe even utopian uh, applications. And uh, Andrei Geim and Konstantin Novoselov, they extracted or they isolated graphene with the help of scotch tape from this tape dispenser here. At the time, they were working in the University of Manchester. Andrei Geim was a professor there, and he had introduced something that he called uh, Friday session of play uh, in the afternoon on Fridays. And during those sessions, his students could do what they wanted. They could examine what they thought was fun. And during one of those sessions, uh, Gaim and Avosielov, they started to think about carbon and if they could just extract small flakes of carbon and see what the characteristics of them would be. So they took some tape here uh, and they just put it on a piece of graphite and they pull it off and they realize we have just a couple of layers of carbon atoms here, uh, but we need it even thinner. So they took some new scotch tape, put it on the first piece, and they pulled it off, and they did it again and again. And finally, they just had one layer of carbon atoms left, and that is graphene. And uh, many people think that this material will revolutionize a lot of industries, and it's still kind of hard to see the application it will have in the future. But we think that it can be used for uh, super fast microcomputers, for super lightweighted airplanes, for example, and uh, within biomedicine, uh, flexible computer screens and many, many more things, things that we can't even imagine yet. Uh, so uh, this seems like kind of science fiction yet already, but there is still a lot of research to be done around this um, materials. We'll just wait and see, and maybe in the future we will see some fantastic things with the graphene. So hold your eyes open. So this is everything here from me uh, in the gallery of the museum. Back to you now, Kalle. Thank you, Lotta. Uh, and now I will hand the word over to Alistair and Camilla again, and they will tell you more about the project Utopian Stories and how you and your students can participate and contribute to real science. So I hand over the word and the stage to you, Alistair, and welcome you back again online, Camilla. Thank you very much indeed. So Camilla and I are both researchers working in really different disciplines. I'm in the natural sciences, Camilla's in the humanities, and together we're trying to do a, we're, we're, we're working on the same problem, how we're gonna make our future brighter. Um, I'm gonna look back, I'm gonna look back to 2020, and I need your help to answer the question, what did you not do in 2020? We're gonna do that in the form of a survey which you can participate in, and you can use the survey to ask other people around you the same questions. You'll find the survey on the Nobel Prize Museum's homepage where you'll find utopian stories. So during 2020, we gave up lots of stuff. We kept distance from one another. 
We washed our hands more often. We avoided shopping unnecessarily. We avoided restaurants, cafes. We avoided indoor gyms. We avoided concerts, cinemas, and theaters. We studied and worked from home, and we avoided unnecessary trips abroad. My part is to tell you which of those changes were best for the climate, which helped the climate by reducing our emissions. I wonder which one you think it was. Which do you think had the most effect? Well, it was avoiding unnecessary trips abroad had the biggest impact on the climate. But what's, that's perhaps not a surprise, but actually the second most important was not buying stuff we don't need, avoiding unnecessary shopping. But there's another side to this, and that's what can we expect people in society to do? Not all of those changes were experienced as negative. Some of them perhaps were experienced as positive. So the question we're thinking about we're going to think about with you is which changes did you find positive or at least what did you find least negative? So what I, am as, I as a scientist am asking your help for is to find out the changes experienced during the lockdown of 2020 that we found that were positive associated with the restrictions, or at least those which were least negative. And I'll help out by working out which caused the biggest emissions reductions. Now I'm gonna hand over now because there are two surveys and Camilla is gonna look forward to the future with you. So I'm passing over to Camilla who will now tell you about the second way you can help us with our research. Thank you, Alistair. And as you say, my part is to, to, to look at future and how, how to find ways to how we can think in other and new ways to find out how we sort of can carry out the transition towards the Agenda 2030. Uh, and if you, if you want to participate and help us collecting stories about the future that I was talking about before, stories that I will analyze and find, uh, you're not supposed to sort of solve the problems of the world, but uh, we want your fantasies and your visions, and I will analyze those and sort of see what kind of worlds they make up together. So if you want to participate uh, and help us col to collect as many stories about the future as possible, uh, you can go to the Nobel Prize uh, Museum's webpage and you will find our questionnaires there. You will find Alistair's and next to it you will find questionnaire or survey number two. Uh, and it could be good to know that before, as we ask you to um, fill in a, a story it could be good to prepare it in advance, maybe on a digital device, so you can copy paste it into the, the web page. And you can write this story any way you wish. It can be short, it can be a description or a, a complete fantasy or something entirely different. This is totally up to our core researchers, the pupils. Uh, and at the Nobel Prize Museum webpage, you will soon also find a lot of material that can help you and inspire you to write those stories. There will be tips about literature you can read, and there will be other material, both for the pupil and for teachers there. So we are looking so much to have you aboard, and we welcome you as our co-researchers to this project, Utopian Stories. So thank you very much. And thank you, Camilla, so much. And thank you, Alistair, as well. And I can't wait to take part of all the material that we will collect together and all the stories from the children about a good future. A warm hand also to all the other speakers participating here, participating here tonight, today, contributing with knowledge and inspiration. And most of all, thank you for being part of this, many of you teachers who have joined us today. And if you want to take part of the presentations afterwards, they will be available shortly at our website. So thank you 
and goodbye. Thank you.